I have a simple sermon today. I am here on assignment. But before I do, I want to say thank you to this church. Thank you to the board of this church. Thank you primarily to Pastor Jason and his family, his wife who could not be here today. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your help with MVP. MVP Leader Group does three things. We honor, encourage, and connect ministry leaders and Christian business leaders all over the country. We're now in 22 states. We now have around 500 leaders who are a part of our group. We meet with 100 to 125 pastors every Thursday for Zoom calls. We do anything that it takes that's within our power to keep people like your pastor and his family in the game doing ministry week in and week out. How many of you are proud of your pastor? How many of you know you need a pastor in your life? I believe my calling in this last season of my life is to help bring water to those who are on the front lines of ministry week in and week out. That calls for many, many things. And before we leave today, I want to share with you a need that I have because we don't win all of our pastors. We don't keep all of our pastors. Everybody that's in ministry today won't be in ministry tomorrow. Sometimes the enemy gets in, sometimes discouragement gets in, sometimes it can become a family issue, sometimes it becomes a health issue, but I am literally fighting in my spirit about 24 hours a day for pastors to stay in the game. And I'm here to tell you in front of your congregation, Pastor Jason, we need you like never before in our lives, brother. We need you to be strong. We need you to be holy. We need you to be, we, we need you to have some energy. We need you to be right before God, brother. We need you to be right before your family. We need you to have a great marriage. Can I get an amen? We don't need a marginal marriage out of our leaders. We need straight up people who are going to be honest with us and honest at home. We don't need you to be truthful in the pulpit and a liar at the house. We need you to be right 24-7 under the eyes and the eyes of God, just like you're calling us to be. Can I get a big amen in this room? This is what we talk about. This is the, these are the things that we champion. That turns into a lot of different things, but the bottom line is we honor them, encourage them, and connect them together to be their best before God. And it's an honor, sir, to be here to fill your pulpit on this second Sunday. And I mean that to the bottom of my heart. I love you, Jason Yarbrough. You're the man. <laughs> you are the man. I want to get into my message today because I believe that this will be a pivotal day for people in this room. I want to start off by talking about a book that was written years and years ago. Y'all remember the book, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? It was written by Robert Louis Stevenson. It's a work of fiction that was first published in 1886 and is considered a classic of Gothic literature. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde were two starkly contrasting personas residing within the same man. Dr. Henry Jekyll, a brilliant and well-respected scientist, had always been intrigued by the duality of human nature. In his quest to separate the good and evil within himself, he concocted a potent elixir. We know the story. When he drank it, he transformed into the sinister Mr. Edward Hyde, a malevolent and monstrous alter ego. At first, the experiment seemed like a harmless exploration. But as time passed, Hyde's wickedness grew uncontrollable. He committed heinous crimes, and Jekyll found himself unable to contain his malevolent counterpart. Eventually, the line between Jekyll and Hyde got blurred out, leading to a tragic end. And Dr. Jekyll's story today serves as a cautionary fictional tale 
illustrating the perilous consequences of attempting to unravel the darker aspects of human nature. For sometimes the evil within can consume even the noblest of souls. Unfortunately, there are many true stories today that are not fiction that backs up that statement. How many of you remember the Holocaust, the systematic genocide of approximately 6 million Jews and millions of other minority groups by the Nazi regime during World War II is one of the most horrifying examples that I could bring to this stage today. What about the Rwandan genocide in 1994 where ethnic Hutu extremists in Rwanda slaughtered an estimated 800,000 people in the streets, mostly ethnic Tutsis, in a brutal and organized campaign of violence. What about the killing fields of Cambodia? During the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia in 1979, nearly 2 million people were killed through mass executions, forced labor, and brutal conditions in labor camps. Lest we talk about everyone else and every other country on the planet, what about the United States of America? What about the things that have happened within our borders? What about the serial killers that we've had to mess with and put up with in our lifetime? Throughout history, individuals like Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy have committed heinous acts of violence and murder, highlighting the capacity for extreme depravity in some individuals. What about human trafficking? Modern day human trafficking involves the abduction, the coercion, and the exploitation of vulnerable individuals, often involving sex, slavery, and forced labor, revealing the depths of human depravity in the pursuit of profit. We can talk about everyone else, but let me tell you this, and let me just stop to say, our United States of America, our own Super Bowl, is the epicenter of human trafficking in this country every single year in the name of a sporting event. Can I go on? Torture and atrocities in wars. What about throughout history, the various conflicts that have witnessed in widespread torture, mass killings, and other atrocities committed by state and non-state actors? People in governments and people outside of governments. What about in our borders, the 911-911 New York Twin Towers attack that cost us 2,996 souls in those buildings? What about when we looked on our, our news story one night and we saw ISIS around this world planting heads on the top of fence rows in that country to strike fear in the world? I'm talking about the human soul and the depravity. What about recently where Hamas went into Israel and literally murdered in the streets at a, at, a, at, a, at a concert and then kidnapped dozens and dozens of people and even put babies in ovens and cooked them alive. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about human beings. I'm not talking about entities that don't have blood flowing through their veins. I'm talking about our stories, our human stories. And lest we sit here and think we're talking about everybody else in the world, what if they put our thoughts and our actions in the secret places of our life? What if we posted those on the screen today? What if our thoughts, Monday through Friday, when we get frustrated, we get angry, we get mad, what if all of those were posted up here today? You say, Pastor Terry, you're talking to the wrong church. We're a holy church. We're a loving church. Did you not see us worship down here this morning? Can I just stop to say that was one great worship service we encountered God through today. Can I get an amen? You know the reason I preach with passion this message today is because these serial killers and these people and even the kid that this week walked into a high school with an AR and shot up people in the hallways of a school, I can almost guarantee you that they sat in the seat of a church. At some point, 
they heard somebody preach to them. At some point, they heard a pastor. What about Putnam County? What about Cumberland County? What about the things that have gone on in these borders? I read some things online. I know you lost a soul last year where somebody kidnapped and killed some girl and took them off in the woods in this county. We can talk about everyone else, but we have a problem with humanity. Jeremiah 17, 9 said this, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Romans 3, verse 10 through 12 says, As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Romans 3, 23, verse through 26 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Aren't we glad for that? So I have a question for you today, and this is the message. In light of all of these things that I've talked about today, in light of how the whole world seems to be groaning under the weight of sin and in the light of what the truth is, of scripture says about us as mankind. The title of my sermon this morning is held in the form of a rhetorical question today. Why are we still here? Why are we still here? First reason, I believe, and the overarching reason Number one is that God is a merciful God. Can I get an amen? He still loves the unlovable. He is still merciful. My mind went back on this front row this morning to when we were building the church in Crossville, Tennessee in the mid-90s. Uh, Trinity Tabernacle. I worked for a guy named Bobby Bowen. And he was a, a man who... he made you work like a dog we not only pastored the youth we not only led the worship many times and did many things within the church every morning we went to that church we went to work with a tool belt on a hammer on our side and we physically built a sanctuary of 450 as a staff and as volunteers in the church one night we had been working all night long it was probably around 11, midnight, something like that. And we were all up in a top room of that sanctuary trying to cut a header block out where someone had made a mistake and put the wrong header block in and we couldn't get the air conditioning system to fit properly. We couldn't get the duct work to fit properly. So there was about five of us in that room who had, uh, uh, we didn't even have the right masking on. We had like bandanas around our, our face to try to keep the dust out. But we were running a concrete saw. Anybody in here know what a concrete saw is? It was, we had a, I, I, don't, I don't even remember what size it was. All I know is we, it was handheld and it was heavy. And I'm five foot two. I was a lot stronger back then and I was getting tired. So we were holding this concrete saw up and it was my turn. And we could only last about two or three minutes a piece before we had to give the saw to somebody else because it was hard work. And I'm telling you, I was grinding on that rock. I mean, dust was flying everywhere, singing around me. And all of a sudden I heard this sing went right by my ear and the blade came off of that concrete saw. We were all in that room waiting on our turn. And I watched that blade, or I, I came to know, I didn't watch it at the time. I just felt it go by my ear. That blade went off of me, went over my shoulder, and went to the middle of the room and literally spun in place and went right down in the middle of the room and did not hurt a single soul in that room. Can I tell you that my night was over after that? I said, boys, I love you. I'm going home. And I handed somebody else the saw and I walked off. But aren't you glad sometimes for the mercy of an almighty God? You don't deserve to be here. You don't, you didn't do anything to deserve to be on a stage, but you're here anyway. You didn't deserve to be able to have time in a service to lift your hands and worship God, but the Lord put you in the room to do it anyway. Can I get a witness in this room? 
You could have been dead. Let me tell you something. Your life could have looked a whole lot different than it does this morning. But how many of you are alive and well today and you can put your hands in the air or together and say, praise God for his mercy over my life. We're too quiet sometimes. We're too quiet sometimes. Can I tell you that even if you're in this room and you've done the worst things in the world in people's eyes, that Jesus still loves the unlovable. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 through 5 says, But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Psalm 103 verse 8 says, The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. Lamentations 3 22 says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each and every morning can I get an amen Micah seven eighteen says where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant overlooking the sins of his special people you will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love Matthew 5 verse 7 says God blesses those who are merciful for they shall be shown mercy Ephesians chapter 2 says but God is so rich in his mercy he said it again. He's so rich in his mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead, we're in this room today. Hebrews 4, 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. If you're in this room and you find yourself in a place where you have done wrong, you have thought wrong, you have been wrong, you have admitted wrong, I'm telling you there is hope for every person breathing in this room if you're still alive you still have a chance if you're still alive the grace and mercy of God is still available for you today there's no one in this room that's done anything so wrong that you cannot receive grace from an almighty God today number two the reason we're still here is that God is generous everybody say generous we've been given time to repent I stood in front of a youth group years ago and we were, had gone through the Pensacola Revival. Do y'all remember the Pensacola Revival? There were people praying all over the nation, people crying out to God, people were repenting. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people had come to Christ, come back to Christ. And we had gone down to the Pensacola Revival as a church, as a staff, and we had started prayer meetings. And one night we had a prayer meeting on a Sunday night and a young lady who lives, still lives in Crossville to this day, her name is Amy Caps. Amy Caps come crying up to me on the stage and she said, Pastor Terry, I need you to pray for Leanne. I said, well, what's wrong with Leanne? She said, I had a dream about Leanne. I had a dream about Leanne that she died and that she went to hell. And she was weeping. She was weeping. And I said, Really? She said, yes. She said, and I'm scared. I said, well, I'll tell you what. We're going to pray for Leanne tonight. And we're going to believe God to save Leanne tonight. How many of you know when you get a burden for someone, you get on your knees and you start praying, right? Can I get an amen? If I got any saints in the house, if I got any prayer warriors in the house. You get on your knees and you pray. But the, but the decision is still up to the person. We began to pray for Leanne Schubert. And I said, secondly... Whatever you've got to do to get her in youth group on Wednesday night, you do your best to get her in that room. And so Amy took me for my word. We prayed hard, and then we invited hard. And she got her in the room. She was on the front row, right where you young ladies are seated, seated today, front of my little youth room, seat about 100. And that night, I have no idea what I preached, but I guarantee it had to do with something with salvation. <laughs> because I went for the throat. I went, let me tell you, I'm a fighter, y'all, if y'all ain't figured that out yet. And if I feel like 
I'm supposed to go after something. I'm going after it with everything I've got. Let me stop right here. I think there are people in this room, your souls are hanging in the balance today. God did not put this message on my heart to preach here for no reason. And I began to preach. And she sat there like a stone cold rock. No response. No movement. No life. And at the end of that service, I gave an altar call. I said, all you have to do is give your life to Jesus. Just raise your hand, we'll pray. The classic altar call. And I let it go, man. I kept going. Because she wasn't moving. And so finally at the end of that thing, I shut it down. And then I went to her personally. I, I said, Leanne, if, if my best friend had a dream about me dying and going to hell this week, don't you, I, I said, if it was me, I guarantee you I would do everything I could to try to get right with God. She looked at me, she, real cold, she said this, she said these words, she said, I can pray if you want me to. Boy, some, a cold chill went down my back. And I said, Leanne, I'm going to tell you something. If it don't mean that much to you, it ain't going to mean nothing to God. Because here's what the word says. If we believe and we confess, we got to believe it in our heart. Not only confess it with our mouth, that Jesus is Lord. Amen? And I said, let me pray for you. And I prayed for her and she walked out of that room. God be my witness. Two days later, Amy Capps is on my phone screaming and crying because that little girl had gone out with her boyfriend and y'all know right where this place is it's the Obed River down by Crossville and she had had an accident and she got killed Leanne Schubert turned out to be my very first solo funeral as a minister I don't know what happened to all the staff that day, but they were all gone. And I had to go do that funeral at Bilbury Funeral Home in Crossville by myself. I walked into the room. The casket's all there. I had to go through the parent, parent meetings where parents are looking at me going, my baby was all right, wasn't she? She was all right, wasn't she? She was all right, wasn't she? And I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm not God. I can only tell you what happened the last service that I was with her. And I am telling you this, I do believe there might have been a moment in time where she could have prayed and cried out to God before she died. So God is the judge. But I can tell you this, because of her decision on a Wednesday night, I walked in and had to do her funeral on Saturday. And they had little bears and stuff on the casket. And I was like, what in the world is that? That's weird. I had no idea. Turned out that day she refused to raise her hand and give her life to Jesus. She made a decision not only for herself, but she made a decision for the baby that was inside of her. No one knew she was pregnant. I only tell you that story to say this. God is generous. And today you sit in this room and you have a chance. If you're in this room and you are not straight with God Almighty, you have another chance today to get it right. You have been given time to repent of sin. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 15 says, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Verse 11 says, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives we should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along, on that day he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth as he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And 14 says, and so dear friends, while you are waiting on these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful, lives that are pure and blameless in his sight and remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved 
What about Saul? You remember Saul in the Bible? Saul was the meanest of the mean. He was pulling Christians out of their homes, dragging them into their yard, throwing it down, holding the coats of people that killed them in the streets. Acts 9 talks about that. What about Peter? How come, how come God didn't, first of all, how come God didn't just destroy Saul when he's out there killing people? How come he didn't just take lightning and zap Saul right there in the yard when he's messing and holding the coat of the people that are stoning Stephen? How, how can he have mercy on a person like Saul? What about Peter? What about Peter when he denied Christ? He had walked with Christ, lived with Christ, uh, ate with Christ, dreamed about the kingdom with Christ. And yet, all of a sudden, even though he, he, he said he wouldn't do it, he ended up doing it, denying Christ three times. Why didn't the judgment of God come to play for Peter when he did that? Why did he not get zapped? Why did he not just get smoked right there on the scene? I'm going to tell you why. Because God is generous and he gives us time to repent. God is generous. What, what happened to Judas? I believe the same thing about Judas. Judas, he sat and did everything every deci other disciple did, but yet he had a, a, a clandestine a, a, a agenda behind the scenes. Why didn't, why didn't God just take Judas out before he could betray Christ and send him to the cross? Because I believe God was giving Judas time to repent. I know what prophecy says. I know he played a part in all that. But God is no respecter of persons today. And if you sit in this room today, you still have time to repent. You've still got time. The third thing I believe we are still here for is because God is long-suffering. And he's modeling what forgiveness really, really looks like. Luke 23, 33 talks about the place of the skull. We know the story. Jesus was hanging on the cross. Why didn't he call a legion of angels? Why didn't he just kill the Roman soldiers who were crucifying him? Why didn't he take out the smart mouth guy on the cross next to him? <laughs> Sometimes it comes down to that, right? I think of everything in the crucifixion, you know, all the pain and agony of it. The thing that blows my mind of how Jesus showed long suffering was when they started spitting on him and pulling his beard out. And I'm going to tell you, there ain't nothing that makes me madder than somebody trying to spit on me. Can I get a witness in this room? I am not Jesus Christ, and you will see an animal come out of me probably. How did he, how did he put up with that? I have no idea. Only the mercy and the love of an almighty God. Because he's long-suffering and he's modeling what forgiveness really looks like. We had an MVP less than six months ago. His wife was out running uh, on a Saturday morning with a friend uh, out on a little country road in Minnesota, a little small town in Minnesota. And uh, they were running on the side of the road. She was on the inside. They were actually in the lane, the right-hand lane. She was on the inside. Her running partner was on the outside. And... There was a little hill, and they had just gone over the hill. I'm telling you, it's nothing but farmland in this little town. I went out there. There's nothing there. It's just farmland. And they're out running on a Saturday morning like, like they'd done probably dozens of other times. And some kid, a teenager, who was not breaking the law, he was not texting, he was not doing anything wrong, he was in his lane, he was just riding through the country, and he came over the hill, and they were in his lane, and in a smooth second, Marie Savage went to eternity. Literally, the kid hit her on the inside, left the other running partner standing in the street. Marie is 100 feet into a field. The other lady is standing there, doesn't even know what happened. They called our MVP pastor. His name is David Savage. He knew the police chief. He had a person on his staff that was on the uh, community fire department or something, so he got the call pretty quick. He ends up going out there, and instead of, this, is, this just blows my mind. I don't know how he did this, but he, instead of going out there and being all, I don't know how you keep from losing your mind in that moment. If I lost my wife, I, think, I don't know how, it'd only be Jesus that could pull this off. They stopped him from running to Marie out in an open field because she was gone. And they said, the lady that was right running with her is over there in the police car David flipped a switch 
and went into ministry mode. He put his needs in the background and he went into ministry mode, went over to the police car, got in the police car and started praying for and ministering to the lady who was left next to his wife who got knocked into eternity. He gets out of that scene and he is automatically pointed to the young man who hit them in the middle of the road. And he ends up going over to the young man and the young man, he starts talking to him about forgiveness. It's okay. I know you didn't mean to do this. He said, how can a God ever forgive me for this? And he began to minister to this kid in the very shadows of his dead wife out in the middle of an open field. Can I tell you that that pastor modeled what true godly forgiveness looks like? I don't understand it. I can't comprehend it. How can a God watch his own son die on the cross and forgive all of humanity in the same moment? But that's exactly what he's calling us to today. He's calling us to the foot of that cross. He is in this room today, and he is here to minister to every person in the way of forgiveness. He's a model for what forgiveness really looks like. And the last thing is this, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He still has a plan for you in this room. Isaiah 46, 10 says, only I can tell you the future before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. Psalm 139, 16 says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Psalm 31, 15 says, my future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. Job 12, 10 says, for the life of everything is in his hand and the breath of every human being. Jeremiah 10, 23, I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. We are not able to plan our own course. Isaiah 64 and 8 says it like this. Oh, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. I close this message with saying this. I'm not God. You're not God. This city is not God. All of humanity is not God. If we look at each other's sins, we're going to immediately say they're guilty. If you look at Terry Allen, you're going to say he's guilty. If you look at me in my whole life, you're going to say he has no right to be on that stage talking today in a microphone. If you'd have watched me growing up in high school, if you'd have watched me as a young adult, if you'd have watched my life, if you'd watch my thoughts, everything I am, you would say, yeah, he don't deserve nothing. He don't, he don't deserve to be where he's at. We have a friend named Mari Davis who's a part of our group. He's an MVP. He told me one time he, he, he pastored the largest church in the Assemblies of God in Tennessee for years and years, Cornerstone Church. He's a bona fide convicted uh, murderer. He spent almost nine years in the penitentiary in Texas he told me one day, he said, no doubt there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have sat in my church and they didn't deserve, they didn't think I deserved to stand on this stage and to declare the glory of God. He said, but if you think I'm quitting because they don't want me here, he said, you are sadly mistaken. Can I tell you, there might be a lot of people in your life that don't think you deserve what you get, but you know what? They're not in charge. God is in charge. None of us are worthy of any single blessing from an almighty God. And today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that we can make it all right. Today is the day that God can clear the record. And it doesn't matter what the record is. I've heard of all these, some of these serial killers even getting saved in prison. Now I do think there are things that you can do that can, that can disqualify you by society from being effective in a certain way. I don't want to lose you today, but there's a few of those things that you can't do and still pastor a church. You ain't going to touch no child and still pastor a church. It's not going to happen. You're not going to lead a church deceitfully for years and years and years and then still be able to pastor that same church. People just won't let you do it. But I'm talking about people. I'm not talking about the kingdom of God. And I'm here to tell you, there's only one unpardonable sin. And I don't think anybody in this room is really smart enough to figure out exactly what that is. 
And if you're convicted today of your sin, today is the day you can make it right. God has me here in my primary form. I stand here with no real qualifications to talk to you about your soul. I ask the Lord on this front row. I say, God, just use me to say something that's going to make a difference. I just want to be a mouthpiece. I begin to think of all the people that sit in churches week in, week out. Church hurt people, family hurt people, school hurt people, bully hurt people. That kid went and shot that school up and there's dozens of others that have done it simply because they were bullied. I was bullied. I'm five foot two. I've been hurt. I've been hurt by family. I've been hurt by pastors. I've been hurt by friends. I've been hurt by society. I've been hurt by political entities. I've been hurt by people in the church. I've been hurt by people outside of the church. I've cried more over people and things that have happened to me inside the church than I have outside of the church. I've wept and asked for forgiveness because I've hurt people in the church. I've walked away from ministry with my hands in the air going, I have absolutely nothing else that I can do or say that's going to make a difference in anybody's life. But I, I'm still here. And you're still here. You're still here. Today is the day. I can't change the past for you. The Lord spoke to me on this front row and said, there's some people in here going, they went through a divorce a long time ago and they're still carrying pain in the middle of their current marriage and they, they're burnt toast and they can't trust like they should trust because of something that happened in a former marriage. I want to heal that today. Is anybody in here like me? You ever recount things that happened to you in high school? Any, any of you athletic guys in here? I can still remember missing tackles my junior year. <laughs> I know it's stupid, isn't it? It's really stupid. I can still remember fights that I didn't fight. And when I'm in the flesh, I want to go back to high school. Isn't it crazy? I want to go back to high school and I want the chance. I, like, I wish that boy would do that to me today. It's ridiculous, isn't it? This mind game that we play, this, this stuff that never goes away. If your church hurt, I'm not gonna tell you to get over it. Only the Holy Spirit can bring you out and help you to get over that. But I can tell you this, I'm not gonna stand still in my life because of what somebody else did to me 20 years ago. I'm going, I'm going in hard with God. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to be a God man. Maybe someone betrayed you. Betrayed you. Ooh. Some of y'all dealing with betrayal. I've dealt with that. That's one of the hardest things I ever dealt with. Somebody that I thought was on my side. And then they screwed me over on the side. Can I just talk plain to this crowd? Somebody I thought was my friend. What's the word say? Mine own familiar friend. Sucker kissed me on the cheek. Put me on the cross. I have to look to Jesus with that. He modeled that. Today is the day of forgiveness. 
Can we bow our heads this morning? Lord, you said there's none, none righteous. No, not, not a one. And really the only thing that keeps us from your forgiveness, your mercy, your long suffering and all of that and, and in right relationship with you is our pride. I'm asking you, God, I'm standing in this altar as a living example of someone who needs your love and your mercy and forgiveness in my life every day. And I'm asking you to fill this altar today with people who are making fresh commitments to be in right relationship with you no matter what has happened in their life, no matter what has been done to them, no matter what they might have done to someone else, but let the past be the past and move forward in their life. God, you've allowed me to start a ministry that looks at pastors and says, we're forward focused. We can't do anything about what you did yesterday, but we can do everything about helping you move forward. And I'm asking you for that same spirit of an almighty God to come into this room, Lord. Come into this room for people who've been hurt by their parents, people who've been hurt by their brothers, people who've been hurt by society, or people that may have inflicted the pain. And I'm asking you to let this room be a room filled with grace and mercy today. And save us, Lord. Save us. Save us from ourselves, God. Save us from ourselves, Jesus. It's not the pastor's fault. It's not mama's fault. It's not daddy's fault. It's, it's us. It's us, Lord. I pray from the front to the back. Your Holy Spirit will convict in this room. Not condemn. Not to push us down and say you're less than or you're not worthy of. But convict us to come to the cross today. If you're in this room and I'm speaking your language today and you say, Pastor Terry, while everybody's still praying, everybody's got their eyes. I, Pastor Terry, I want to raise my hand. I want to meet you down there. I want to I want to get it right. I want to get it right. I want to get it right before God. I don't want to live a bitter man. I don't want to live an unholy man. I don't want to live as a sinful person. I want to live for Jesus. I, I, I understand what you're saying today and I'm raising my hand right now. I want it. I want it. I want the mercy and the long suffering and the power of God to come into my life. Just raise your hand all over this room. Just raise your hand. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, 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 thank you. If you got your hand in the air, I just want you to stand up right now. Just stand up right now. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you got on. I don't care your qualifications. I don't care who you are. I want you to stand up right now and I want you to meet me down here in this altar right now. Come on. Let the first one be you. Let the first one be you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just come down here. Altar workers, come down with them today. Altar workers, come down with them today. Hallelujah. Come here, brother. God's got you, brother. Hallelujah. 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. If God's calling you, come on. Come on, step up. Step up. It don't matter who you are. The greatest decision of your life. The greatest decision of your life. Come on. This is the day. This is the day of salvation. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can everyone stand in the room? Can we give a hand clap of praise to the Lord for what He's doing in this room right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want everybody to listen to me. I know this, to come out of a crowd is a tough thing. I know it's a tough thing because we all have different qualifications. We all have different 
titles and who we are is who we are, right? But when you come out, you're making a public profession that I need Jesus in my life. Totally. I don't know if it's recommitment. I don't know if it's first time. It don't matter what I know. What matters is you're standing here before God. You're standing here before God. And I just want to simply lead us in a prayer today. Step up here, brother, because I want to hold. I want to. I want to. Come close. Come close. Everybody that's praying this prayer with me, come close. Say this prayer with me. Just repeat this prayer. Say, Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I need you in my life. I'm making this public commitment to come to you because I need you. Save me. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe Because you died and shed your blood, I can be free. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise today? Come on, give the Lord some praise today. Come on, man. You're saved, brother. You're free. Put your hands in the air and praise the Lord. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah.